You guys are very lucky to have Pat doing all this work for you. Big, really needs a bigger round of applause. Wow, I flipped the light switch and nothing happened. There we go. And then, oh, I see what that one did. No, it didn't do anything. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the, pro the problem I, I see across the country is with the resurgence of interest in beekeeping um, and the difficulties with beekeeping. I spoke last night about how easy beekeeping used to be, that any hobbyist could get a hive and there was nothing to keeping bees alive. Nowadays, it's much harder, and there's a, a severe lack of good mentorship across the country. There are, there are, I visited some clubs that have hundreds of members of which not a single one has any idea how to keep bees or, or do a hive inspection or handle bees or anything. And, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's, very, it's very sad and they're just so hungry for information and, and for seeing uh, somebody uh, who, can actually, who actually has experience with keeping bees and uh, can share that knowledge. So uh, for Pat to do this for you is, uh, is just in, incredible. <coughs> So um, she asked me to put together a, um, a PowerPoint about uh, doing hive inspections. And what I did is I, I, I put a couple of different uh, ones together. I'll see how far I get uh, today. If, if we may blow off some of the pesticide stuff at the end of the day, because that, that's of much less interest to me than um, <coughs> uh, bee husbandry. So um, uh, we'll see how many slides we, we get through here. OK, so I'm going to start off with talking about actually just some tips of how to inspect a hive. One of the problems is many beekeepers are fearful of the bees, their bees, and they wind up wearing veils and gloves and all kinds of stuff, which makes it really hard to handle bees and really hard to see anything on the combs when you're looking through a, a veil. The sooner you can get comfortable working with your bees um, so that you can wear less gear, you're less hot, you don't have gloves on, the, the better a beekeeper you can be. So I'm going to give you some tips on just how to learn how to uh, keep, uh, how to handle bees first, and then we'll go to what you should look for inside the, uh, the hive. Let me turn this on. There we go. <clears throat> we have a, a booth I built at our county fair. It's a, a redwood frame, hexagonal booth, about six feet across, and we put a beehive in the middle. And then once a day, uh, one of us just steps inside uh, the booth like this, and it's got black screen on it, and then the audience can, and it's open at the top. The bees fly free in, the, in our county fair at the top because they fly over, over the tops of your head. <clears throat> and then the audience comes around and stands there with their faces right up to that black screen, and they watch one of us hand, hand do, be, do a hive inspection without any protective gear on. And the thing they <laughs> always ask is, why aren't the bees attacking you? The people in the audience are far more threatening to me. They could do a lot more damage. If I grabbed one of their children and started strangling that kid, I would be killed. The bees aren't going to kill me. Humans are a gr much greater threat there. So the reason that they aren't attacking me is about response threshold. That all animals, no matter how sweet they are, have a <laughs> defensive response threshold. And no, when we look back at this animal right here, this is uh, one of the pinnacles of human wolf breeding. We've been breeding wolves for about 7,000 years, and we've taken it to the point now we have things, wolves called toy poodles and Pekingese. Those are all wolves. But you pass the response threshold, the defense threshold of that wolf, and they turn right back into a wolf, and they will tear your throat out. The point is we learn how not to do that with dogs, because humans have lived with, with these domesticated wolves for, for thousands of years, and humans have an innate ability to say, oh, don't push a dog that far. Don't go over the response threshold so that it goes into self-defense. So what you want to do is understand the response threshold of honeybees. And you just, if you never make a honeybee feel threatened, it has no reason to respond to you and try to sting you. Honeybee dies if it stings you. It is not in the self-interest of a honeybee to sacrifice its life to sting you unless it feels that it is defending the colony. So make don't try not to get the, the bee to feel that it's defending, that it has to defend the colony. So let's go at safe hive inspection. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is obviously a joke. <laughs> um, you're going to dress appropriate to the situation. So here's a, um, an old, back, back when I was a young guy uh, working bees right here, but dressed appropriately for the situation. It's hot weather, I don't want to get heat stroke. And that's all that was necessary. I'm not getting stung up. 
This guy here is dressed appropriately the situation. He apparently is trying to emulate a bear behavior as he goes into his hive. And you can see the bees <laughs> responding to this guy. So he is dressed appropriately. What he probably could do is be a little more gentle with his bees and he could probably wind up dressing more like uh, me over, over here. Uh, and this is still pretty much not far from how I worked 1,500 hives all through most of the se season. We were very, I mean, this, I'd be overdressed right now. <laughs> um, I saw, saw is, uh, is Emma here yet? She's not here, okay. She, she was wearing these, these tight jeans last, yesterday, and, and, and I, I thought of the slide. This is Denise Qual, this is off of her website. She's a pollination broker. And uh, this is a good example of what, how not to dress. The tight clothing allows the bee stingers to penetrate your clothing. Wear loose clothing when you're working bees. If you want to wear tight, ladies, you want to wear tight clothing, do it after you're out of the bee yard. That'd be just fine with me. But in the bee yard, wear loose clothing. And then protect your face. What bees aim for, the only honeybees that have survived human predation and mammal predation are those that had the behavior to aim for the most the place that gives the most um, uh, uh, response by the, uh, the human attacker, and that is to go straight for the eyes. So the bees go right for the face, so protect your face. So if you're starting out, always wear a veil. Wear a veil at least until you get to the point where you no longer have the swelling reaction to, to bee stings. And even then, you, you still want to watch your eyes. <laughs> and I, I love this. Uh, a, bee, a beekeeper posted this at BL some years ago, Aaron, I don't know if you remember it. He was the guy who um, was holding the skunk by the tail because he had heard as long as you, a skunk's hanging by his tail, he can't scent. He goes, unless you accidentally let his front legs touch a 55-gallon drum. And he was asking on BL how to deal with skunk scent all over you. <laughs> and he said, if you're going to be dumb about it, you better be tough. So yeah, um, protect your face until you no longer have these kind of swelling uh, reactions. Um, this is, uh, oh, my son had just gotten this handy Leatherman tool uh, for his birthday, and he had it in his pocket. He's waiting for something to do with it, and we had this helper come out. Uh, this guy now, he just wrote me, he just, he's running 250 hives now, um, and he got so distracted just simply by having a bee inside his ear canal. Um, so my, we tried to figure out how to get this bee out. We tried blowing in the opposite ear. It didn't, didn't dislodge the, <laughs> the bee at all. Um, so my son goes, oh, my Leatherman tool, and he grabs out the, the pliers on it. That was able to get the bee out of there. So um, you really don't want bees in your ears. This is my son, Eric. My, I got a lot of pictures of my, of my, my two sons and my wife, uh, Stephanie, in, in here. So this is Eric, my older, older son. Um, this is the way Eric typically address, uh, dresses. He uh, uh, just wears a t-shirt and a, uh, a veil, if necessary, thrown over his uh, face. It's been interesting watching the evolution of my sons over... I mean, 10 years ago, they both wore full coveralls and, and full gear. Then they evolved to just wearing jackets. And then they evolved to, now they just wear, uh, throw a veil on. Uh, and now, most of the time now, they don't even put the, the, the veil on. Now, during the winter, or when it's, we're work, we work bees if it's snowing, if it's raining. We're commercial beekeepers, so weather means nothing to us. It doesn't change our bee working at all. We just change our clothing, okay? So we work bees if it's, we, we'll make nukes in the middle of a snowstorm. It doesn't make a bit of difference. It just, we just wear different clothing. But if we do that, we will wear more gear. So we'll, if we're working bees when it's snowing, we're going to wear gloves and, and, and full protective gear. But they've definitely been, uh, been, they've been changing. Um, this is T Tiffany Bates, a friend from uh, Australia, and, and this is Ray Oliveris. He's the uh, owner of Oliveris Honeybees. Um, and Tiffany and my wife both uh, do this. They just put a scarf over their head. They find if they put a scarf over their uh, long, dark hair, it keeps just, just like, okay, looks like you. It keeps the bees out, out of your hair. Very simple thing to do. <coughs> Sunglasses. Man. Sunglasses to a defensive guard bee mean these are big eyes. Aim for them. So no sunglasses in the bee yard, no dark wristwatch bands. Any dark spot against light skin will just attract any bees that are going to be defensive. <coughs> I really uh, uh, am enjoying now these, uh, just the lightweight jacket with the, uh, the flip-up hood. And that way, as you're working down a, a, a bunch of hives, you get to one that maybe is a little bit touchy, you just flip that hood on, on your face for a minute and then um, you can flip it back off when you, when you don't need that. So you can respond to that. I, 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 um, as I get older and it's a little harder for close-up vision, I, 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 it's really hard for me if I have a veil in front of my face to, to spot things. So I, I have one as, as seldom as possible. So the flip-up hood helps a lot. If we're working at night, there's this unloading in almonds right here. 
uh, full protective gear. And then the joke always is, oh, you can just hold the flashlight. <laughs> and most of you get the joke that, that that's where the bees are going to fly, at, at that flashlight, the flashlight holder. Work barehanded. Um, if you screw, if you, as you're learning beekeeping technique, you don't need a human teacher. The bees are excellent teachers. They are so patient. Every time they get screwed up, they will remind you by giving you a sting to the hand and it gets your attention. Um, and eventually you get to the point of, of working bees barehanded. You stop getting stings to the hand and now you've learned actually how to handle frames and work bees, okay? And they will tell you by, by stopping stinging you in the hands. So you don't have to ask a human being how you're doing. The bees will tell you if you simply don't wear gloves. Now, if you do want to wear gloves, I would recommend using uh, the lightweight nitrile gloves. Um, I should have taken a picture of them. We just discovered uh, this last winter five mil white colored long cuff nitrile gloves, 11 inch nitrile gloves. Fantastic. Way better than blue gloves, black gloves, um, latex, anything else. The, uh, the long cuff nitriles go underneath the sleeve of your, of your jacket and the white color the bees just totally ignore and you have really good sensitivity and uh and they're quite strong we um i t i've been t i tested them this winter making nukes where we're making about 150 nukes a day just assembly line and um i get up to four days of use on one pair of nitrile gloves really worthwhile got them off of uh, amazon here's another huge thing you work out work your bee yard and the neighbor walks down the driveway and the beekeeper says, he says, what you doing? He says, oh, come on over. And the beekeeper is here in full protective gear with a veil on. The neighbor is there with no gear on at all. And when that neighbor gets stung in the eye, how does that make you look? You have a responsibility to the community around you to make sure they have a good impression of beekeeping. And if you sting your neighbors in the eyes while you're wearing full gear, that's a huge mistake. If somebody's, if you have a veil on, don't allow anybody without a veil to approach anywhere within singing distance at all. Just stop them. Say, stop right there. You stop what you're doing. You walk over. You take your gear off. You put it on the visitor. And then you walk back with no gear on. And then the visitors don't get stung because you will notice it before the visitor. Okay? Okay? It's irresponsible to allow a non-beekeeper to approach a hive that you're working if you're wearing gear and they're not wearing gear. Okay, different kinds of hive inspections. These guys obviously are doing adversarial hive inspection. You can see the bees all over them. And they can just work like a bunch of bears in those, in those hives because they are protected. Here's me and my sons doing a, a large-scale uh, trial, field trial. And uh, we'll work all day long just dressed, dressed like that. Um, we're, it's a non-adversarial uh, uh, working of bees. So understand what it is that makes the bees initiate that response threshold, what that response threshold is, what tips them that you do that tips them over the edge to initiate defensive bee behavior. <coughs> so really what you got to do is, is bees don't think like human beings at all. Don't put that on to bees. They are not humans. Their minds work differently. Their eyes work differently. They sense the world very, very differently than you do. They have no idea that there's a human being walking around and, and the layout of the trees, and they have no idea that they're living inside a hive. As far as they're concerned, they're living in a hollow tree, and, and some stimuli initiate defensive behavior. Understand what those stimuli are. So anything that, it, that tells them that it's likely a human or a honey badger or a bear or a chimpanzee, those, those are the main predators that honeybees evolved with. So avoid any of those cues. <coughs> this is an interesting website uh, uh, here uh, from a guy named Andy Geiger. <coughs> he made an artificial uh, uh, bee eye of all the, uh, the facets of the omatidia. And um, uh, so this is, a, this is how this looks to a human being. That's how it would look to a bee. This is how it looks to a human being. That's how it would look to a bee. They see the world completely different than you do. So these are some of the cues that they recognize. What you want to do is not give them these cues. Y'all remember Dick Cheney? 
keep us in a state of perpetual fear. You know, what's, what's your, when you wake up in the morning, you can check the news and find out what the risk level is for you that day. You know, wow, is this a yellow, a yellow day? Um, really good for government, but, but not so good for, uh, for how you feel living. Anyway, that beehive is the same way. I think about what level that hive is, is at. And there's predisposing factors, and the higher the predisposing factors of what happened uh, the day before or the night before, then starts the risk level up at a, at a higher or a lower uh, level. So one of those factors would be any kind of jarring. And I was down in LA last uh, two years ago, and we we're gonna do a field demonstration, and the guy said, uh, here, I got all these hives, and they're, they're all on a bench. And he goes, some of them are likely Africanized. And he picked up a smoker and he went clank and he put it down on the first hive, which then put the, the vib transmitted the vibration to the entire row of hives with a group of hobbyists there trying to learn how to work bees. I said, what in the world are you doing? You just upgraded the risk factor for that entire group of hives, one of which may be African. Um, uh, so be very careful. I see a lot of beekeepers that take the smoker and they go up to the front of the hive to give a puff of smoke. They go clank because <laughs> they overestimate the, underestimate the distance to the hive, and they clank the front of the hive, and then they puff the smoke. Well, you've already screwed up right there with that first bang on the hive. Putting hives on stand where you have a vibration transmission board in between them does not work well. That's what, one of the problems with, with putting hives on pallets, that you work on any one hive, uh, the other three hives will feel the vibration of the first hive. By the time you get to the fourth hive, they're already way on edge. They're at level orange before you even start working that hive. So individual hive stands, the best hive stand for the uh, hobbyist is two 8816 concrete cinder blocks laid flat side down, the rear one about a half inch higher than the front one. That does not transmit any vibration, very stable, allows you to weed whack around them without transmitting the uh, vibrations up. Uh, I highly recommend cinder blocks. And then when you're working out there, as people watch me work, I hear again and again, Randy, it looks like you're doing Tai Chi around the hives, and that's it. There's a certain speed of movement that the bees will tolerate, and you exceed that speed, and you're going to start getting stung up. Now, when there's a big honey flow on, that speed can be pretty fast. When there's no honey flow on and the bees are robbing, that speed has to slow way down. What we do is, is we judge that speed of how fast you're able to work uh, bees on that particular time. And that's time of day. As the day gets later in the afternoon, you've got to slow your speed down. In the morning, when they're all actively gathering nectar, you can work a lot faster. So working bees after work is already disposing you uh, to a higher uh, start level of defensiveness. Here we are, uh, my son and I, Eric, uh, putting on snow on the ground. We're opening up, we do about 400 hives a day like this, treating them with oxalic acid dribble, with never even lighting a smoker. Okay, we just work at a little bit slower speed to go at it. Here's Eric again. I notice a difference, um, the hair color and the, and the beard. And I don't know if there's something also, Eric does wear deodorant and he showers regularly, um, but there's something about the two of us. The two of us can walk side by side through a bee yard and he'll pick up five times as many things as me all the time. It pisses him off immeasurably, immeasurably, that he cannot figure out why I can just walk through a yard and it's no magic about it but there's something about color or, or, or something that makes a huge difference. I was working uh, bees years ago, this, this is not me, um, but I was wearing socks and boots like this and shorts. It was late in the day, the bees were starting to get pretty pissy and I started getting stung around the leg and so I finished up the work and, and then went down to pull the stingers out of my leg and at each of my legs there was a ring of stingers right above the sock level. Nowhere else in my body. I was short sleeves, nowhere else in my legs. Why? Why would that ring stingers be right there? Trying to get inside. Good guess. So, wait, wait. Somebody, uh, okay, I gotta tell you something. When I'm giving presentations, <coughs> this is not kindergarten. When I ask a question, I'm ask, not asking for random guesses. I'm asking for a, a, an answer that you can defend. If you can't defend an answer, just let it pass. Let me try it again. An answer you can defend. Why did I get a ring of sting right around the top of each sock? Dark color. Dark color. Not only, and, and why, that, that red's not very dark. Black. It's black. They, see red as they, can't see red. they can't see red, so it looks black to a bee. To a bee, it's a dark color, yes. 
And the second thing? It's wool. It's wool. Wool socks. So two cues, dark color and animal hair, wool's animal hair. And that's the, that it was two steps to initiate the defensive response, and that made the bees sting me right there. Nowhere else on my body, just a ring around the top of each ankle, around the top of the socks. These are warning bumps. See these two bees right here? There's one there, there's one there. They're both about to bump me. This is my first selfie I ever took. <laughs> In fact, one of, I think, two selfies. Um, uh, th those are bees being polite and saying, we are going to be defensive today. And to me, what they're, I interpret that as saying, well, perhaps I should put a veil on today. <laughs> and uh, perhaps I should make sure the smoker is really well fired up, okay? Or maybe this is not the right time to work this yard of bees or figure out what's going wrong. We had an issue um, uh, a couple weeks ago when there was something blo in bloom, I can't remember this last night, that all the bees in the yard got um, hotter than, in all their yards, got hotter than firecrackers. You walk in and they just start hitting you, meeting you at the entrance of the yard. This is really unusual for our bees because we breed for very gentle bees. And the best I could figure is there was something came into bloom that just uh, upregulated uh, the bees' uh, defensive response, made them pissy. In other countries, like in Australia, there's some, some blooms that are well known for that. You just don't go into your hives when they're working uh, certain plants when they're in, in flower because they get so pissy. Is there anybody in the audience who's illiterate, can't, cannot read? Aaron, are you sitting close enough? Okay, good. <laughs> and I'm not gonna, I, I, do, I don't uh, read office slides then. Okay, so what we do is we raise all our own queens. We have a zero tolerance policy for calling his sting much. We just pinch the queen right off and uh, re replace her. Uh, in a few years, you can keep very, very gentle bees. I highly recommend you all learn how to raise your own, your own queens and keep and demand gentle stock. It's, um, we did a demonstration out here yesterday, and uh, one of the hives we went into was really a pissy hive. It was a, such so that I would have killed that queen <laughs> as soon as I opened the hive. <laughs> just, uh, we, we would not tolerate that. It's, no, it's just no fun uh, working uh, hives that are defensive. Understand when they're going to be defensive and when they're not. When a colony is freshly swarming, you can do no wrong. You can walk up to this swarm and take your hand and just slowly press your hand all the way through that swarm and out the other side, and the bees will not sting you. You wait until they've hung there for three days with no nectar flow when they're a dry and you can't even get near them, okay? So understand the difference. If there's a nectar dearth on, here we're feeding the colonies that are very, very hungry, they're gonna be very defensive. If there's robbing going on, they're gonna be defensive. If, here's my wife Stephanie, this is one of our yards that, that my sons just hate this yard. So we only want to go because it's always in the shade. In any yard in the shade, you're going to get a whole lot more stinging than a yard out in the sunshine. So we, we try to time our visits to our yards so that we hit uh, yards that do have shade when we hit them when the sun's on, on the hives. get way less stinging. Why does shade, why does shade I have no idea. But it, <laughs> empirically, we, we have seen that happens every single time. Soon, soon as, and even in the same yard, the hives in the sun and the hives in the shade, the hives in the sun are pussycats to go through. So usually my sons say, hey, we'll take these hives over here, and dad, you take those hives over there. They, my sons learned very quickly which hives to work. Yeah. Yes? Bears like shade. You know, you've never seen bears and predators out hmm. walking around in the That's an interesting, could be. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that provides shade there, doesn't it? Because the alternative to that canopy is colony death. So the beekeeper has to make a decision. Do you want your colonies all to die from too much heat? Or yeah, yeah. No, but I just wondered if you were going to create a similar situation by having that, that canopy. I don't know. Likely. I don't know. And when the colonies are that stressed by heat, it's, it's a whole different thing. They, they act very differently. Was, they're, they're just hanging out to survival. Yeah. Last night, we, we looked at the chart showing uh, breeding for characteristic, uh -huh. we gain what we lose. Yeah. Breeding for gentle bees, he fielded that opposite side. I think it was robbing and some other factor. Could be. be. And, a, and when you say gentle, case. gentle is a huge word. That's a, it's a relative term. Right, because so really right. what you should be looking at is what are the specific cues that it respond to. So really you're we're breeding, I'm breeding for bees that do not respond to the cues that this human beekeeper gives to the hive. 
Okay, they can defend themselves against bears all they want. Okay, my bees. Well, I, I can see someone else looking at your, you know, beginner and saying these are aggressive bees. They're, they're huge brains. Are yeah, and I'll, and here's what the other thing is. I will go to a lot of of uh, colonies uh, that beginners have, and they say, oh god, the bees are just hotter than a firecracker. I do that all the time. Yeah, and you go in there, and they're just they're pussy cats. It's 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 the beekeeper. It's not not the bees. And you don't know what to say. I do. <laughs> we are, I was uh, in San Francisco. We, I did a class a few years ago. And uh, at the break, at lunchtime, we were going to go out to a, uh, a park nearby. And a, somebody had a beehive there. And we all went out there. And San Francisco is cold during the summer, summertime. So the whole class gets there, crowds around this hive. And at the last moment, the beekeeper says, oh, by the way, this is really a pissy hive. And it's stacked five deeps high. And I look around, and the entire class is all wearing wool dark sweaters because it's cold San Francisco and no gear whatsoever. And I'm thinking, great, what a perfect situation for a, a bee demonstration. Before we completely leave the topic, and I could say this for what Yeah, speak up a little more so everybody okay, can hear you. We were talking about bee protection and something that I deal with, and you folks may also, really probably not. I have two yards. I wear full coveralls and so forth, not for protection from the bees, but from the beer ticks. Oh, we do it for mosquitoes in some yards. Okay. Yeah, some yards the mosquitoes eat us up. We've had a real issue. I spent time in the hospital with lines this year. Mm -hmm. I have two other beekeeping guys who are spending a lot of time in the yard in the hospital with Lyme disease. Yeah. Where, where are you from? Maryland. Huh? Right at the border of Maryland and PA. And our yeah. beer tick population is. Yeah, there's, I, I've seen yards uh, here on the East Coast where the ticks are on the edge of the, of the hive cover just waiting for you. So yes, very good point. Be very tick aware. Okay, if you have, this is uh, skunk scratching right here uh, where the skunks come up at night and they, they scratch the entrance and they put their paw down and they roll the bees on the ground and they release alarm pheromone. And um, I have a couple of hives right outside my uh, bedroom window. And, uh, we had a skunk last year that knew this technique, and you could just hear the roar of that skunk. We were lucky enough uh, a few weeks ago, I heard a skunk at night, and we have a, we, my wife and I went over there and opened the curtain on the window, and we could watch the skunk just about from here to your foot. And this skunk was a naive skunk, had not learned this technique yet. And what he would do is very cautiously approach the hive, and when he got about this far from the hive, you could see him get really jumpy, and all of a sudden he'd go, oh, and he'd jump around, because a bee would fly out and get in his fur, and he would roll on the ground or, or bite at it and knock the bee off, and then dig through the oak leaves to find that bee and eat that bee. <laughs> and then he'd go back and he'd slowly approach a hive again, because he didn't want to get stung, but he wanted to get those bees. And he did that. We watched for 15 minutes. He got about 10 bees in that 15 minutes. Every time the technique, exactly the same. Slowly approach the hive. When a bee got in his fur, he just looked like he was freaking out, rolling and stuff, knocking the, in the oak leaves, dig it up, and repeated that. Uh, these, these skunks are actually, uh, clearly know what they're doing. What we do is a very simple technique here. We just get um, household lye, uh, uh, the white crystal drain opener. You sprinkle about a teaspoon um, right in the scratching area here. You can watch the crystals. They immediately just absorb moisture and dissolve into the soil. And uh, skunks don't like the taste of it. And you train the skunks not to do it. The skunks stay there in the yard. Uh, you can still see all the skunk droppings, but they stop scratching at your hive entrances. What do you put, what, what do you put on it? Lie, household lie, like white lie crystals. Not in the hive, sprinkle some on the soil. Don't sprinkle it on yourself, it's a very dangerous chemical. Okay? There you go. <laughs> oh, tomorrow, uh, by the, tomorrow at the field session, Aaron is going to demonstrate the, his, his skunk technique. You're, oh, and, and Nancy may need to ride back uh, from somebody else if Aaron is, is not good on the skunk technique. If you have wasps at the entrance, the colony's going to be more uh, defensive. Um, work your hives when the older bees, the only bees in the hive that sting, will sting you are older bees. Young bees won't sting at all. So when the, when the field force is out foraging, work your hive then. If you have poor brood rearing, okay, oh, here's a good chance. What's the condition of this colony? Who can diagnose it? No guesses. Who can tell me what cues you can see from this frame and diagnose what the problem is with this colony? Queenless. Not laying worker. Wait, drone layer and queenless are two different things. Which one? 
You see a queen, so it cannot be queenless. Oh, okay. It's a drone-laying queen. The queen's right here. There's drone cells scattered in there. No larval cells, a drone-laying queen. Okay? You have a colony like this, you're not going to have any young bees. It's going to be all old bees. If you do an alcohol wash, you pick this frame up, you shake them in the tub, 100% of the bees will fly out instantly. You will not be able to get a sample of young bees because they're... Uh, the, and that by the way, the alcohol wash doing that, shaking bees in a tub, tells you a lot about colony population, how well the queen's doing, the, the ratio of, of egg-laying or recruitment to uh, adult bees. You uh, yeah, uh, you, you can often. This one you would not. There would be no, there would be no queen at this war because they have a queen. But these bees, when you shook them in a tub, would all immediately fly out, which would tell you there's a real big problem with recruitment in this colony. And they also will sting a whole lot more. Oh, that was the queen right there. Uh, when we're making nukes, what we do is um, we set up a, uh, a table. We do it like an assembly line. Eric goes out and he just starts popping the lids. We crowd him into uh, yards when we come back to almonds. He just goes down and pops the lids and if they are wall-to-wall -wall bees at the top, we, we nuke that one up that day. If not, we put the lid back on, let them grow a little bit more. He carries them over to here and we have uh, deboxers set up on this table. So um, you put the, the box on there and push down on the box and it looks like all the frames pop up. Actually, it's an illusion. The box goes down and the frames stay in the same place. But uh, it looks like they pop up. It makes it really easy to uh, to pull them out, and then we just uh, have a semi line of, of nukes right here and just take those off to the truck. Notice my protective gear? Yeah, that's not jarring. To like We're making, we typically make about 50 nukes an hour doing this, sometimes 100 nukes an, an, an hour, and oftentimes don't have to put on any protective gear at all. Why? And we never wear gloves. Why? <laughs> where are all the older bees? They all flew back to where the hive was. If you move your boxes away, there's no bees that are going to sting you left in that hive. They, when they fly out, they're going to fly right back home. They're not going to defend this table because this is not where the, where the location of the colony is. So if you have a hot colony, if you want to inspect it, move the boxes physically away from the home location, do your inspection, and then move them back when you're done. Okay, I already talked about uh, nectar. Uh, we had an issue um, a few, we oh, got a month or so ago down in, in uh, Central California Bay Area with uh, two dogs got killed from a hobbyist uh, and the uh, uh, bees. And of course, immediately the press put two and two together that there was one report that Africanized uh, 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 DNA had been found near the Bay Area and the second was these two dogs getting killed. Oh, it must be Africanized bees. And I said, no, it was not Africanized bees. First, the press report was wrong about the DNA. It was somebody uh, it actually had a buckfast queen, which had mitochondrial DNA from African origin. So, but it was not an Africanized bee. And the second was, <laughs> they would have noticed Africanized bees long before those dogs got killed. What happened is some beekeeper uh, was going to do the garden landscaping and just moved a big hive out in the middle of the day, leaving the field force behind. It clustered that night, and then they sprayed it inadequately with some uh, insecticide. And the next day, those bees were hotter than firecrackers and killed a couple of dogs. That was totally beekeeper error. So the, by a, a number of the, the, um, the acetylcholine, um, or, uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors the, that in, in, uh, stimulate nerve impulses in bees will stimulate defense response, okay? Makes the bees really jittery. Just like you guys, if I give you a whole bunch of coffee, you're gonna be a little bit more defensive, okay? Same with the bees. And then alarm pheromone. Completely changed the game. The first smell of alarm pheromone. We were working a, 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 a really tight yard of bees just at dusk um, last year. Uh, three of us or four of us in, in the yard. And the, the bees will let you work up to, as you approach dusk, they will tell you how many more hives you will be able to work. And I'll say, okay, guys, we, worked, we got time to work two more hives. And they'll say, yeah, we are wondering, Dad. And we'll, then, we'll, and, and, because we're working independently, and then we'll get to the next one, we'll go, oh, maybe one more hive. And they'll go, yeah, <laughs> I'm quitting right now. And then after that next hive, the whole yard, every bee, there, you will not be able to work another hive. And all the hives do that in synchrony. I don't know what it is, but they, there's a time when you just can't work anymore. Anyway, we were approaching that time, and I'm working along, and all of a sudden, I start getting bumped by bees. And I said, everybody stop. 
that's all you have to say. All four other people, three other people in the yard, we just all stop. And then we start talking, okay, we gotta give them 45 seconds a minute. Okay, no problem, you just chat about things. Everybody just freezes. And you allow the alarm pheromone to dissipate. And I say, okay, go back to work. And we all go back to work. If we hadn't all stopped in that minute, that yard would have been unworkable within a minute. Nobody could have worked any highs. It would have just been total disaster stinging. Know when to stop. I had a, um, a lady call me hysterics uh, last year. She goes, it was October. She says, oh, that nuke you sold me this spring, they're just hotter than firecrackers. You gotta do something, come over here and get them. And she was, oh, she was in hysterics. I found out after I talked question the next day and I did go over and pick up the, the hive and swap it out. Um, she had not pulled her honey during summer. So she waited till October after work. Well, October after work is, is late in the day. It's not a good time to pull honey. And the bees told her that and started stinging her. So being reasonable, when the bees started stinging her, she said, oh man, well, I'll show them. So she goes back in the house, she gets her ski suit, full ski suit, puts her ski suit on, puts her coveralls over that, and she continues to pull all the honey off of that hive. And those bees, she just kept aggravating, aggravating until it was just an absolute disaster of, of bees stinging there. I went out the next day, took all those bees. I said, okay, I'll swap them out. Shook all the bees dressed like this, shook them off the combs and replaced all the combs of bees, replaced the queen and everything like that. It wasn't the bees at all. It was the beekeeper not recognizing the effect of all that alarm pheromone. So listen to the bees. Yeah. Do you work your hives from the bottom up or the top down? <laughs> well, I, generally you have to start at the top because otherwise you can't reach the bottom. You got to take the top box off first, right? I, 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 your question is what? Well, do you take the top box off and work the, next, work the bottom box, then put the top box back on and work that one? Oh, when you say work, what, what kind of work are you doing? Inspection. How many frames do you inspect in a hive? Pardon? How many frames do you inspect in a hive? Three or four. Okay, uh, the three or four that we usually inspect would be in the three or four in the upper brood chamber, mm -hmm. in the center. Generally, typically, we just look at one or two frames. So we would, there's, unless we have a real reason to go into the bottom box, we would not go there. You can learn everything you need to know from the upper brood chamber. It's rare that we would go into a, the lower brood chamber for an inspection. His question is taught. Is what? His question is taught. You will hear that being taught. Oh, okay. From the bottom and work on it. Okay. Well, my question is, yeah. before you ever enter a hive, Ask yourself, what's the question you're trying to answer? Why bother this hive? If you don't know exactly why you're going into the hive, what are you trying to determine? You can determine pretty much everything you need to know from a middle brood frame of the top of the brood chamber. Yeah. I don't know. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'll bet. Um, so, uh, sometimes I'll set my top box aside on a, a stand next to it and give them back their top entrance yeah. and play around, and then I'll do the top box last. Yeah. As I'm yeah. Down. I haven't worked with the top entrances, but I would immediately suspect that would be a big problem in hive inspection that because of all those forages coming back, the older bees, that that would tend to make things more complicated. Um, we get a lot of helpers come out, volunteer, and I try to be polite. My sons are not. And <laughs> when they get stung up because of a helper, um, uh, that helper doesn't get invited back and they often gets a pretty good re verbal reaming also. Uh, yeah, all it takes is one person in a bee yard to just ruin beekeeping that whole yard for everybody else, that clumsiness of a single person. By the way, I just took this picture. This guy actually is a wonderful beekeeper and a wonderful guy. It was just a great picture. <laughs> he's, from, he's from Lithuania. Came out and visited me. Um, this is a guard bee. This is guard bee stance. Front legs up, wings cocked to 45 degrees, head following your movements. Learn to recognize guard bees. Those are the only bees in the hive that will normally sting you, unless there's a lot of alarm pheromone, and then the other older bees will also sting. But in general, the only bees that initially will do any defense would be the guard bees. <coughs> the guard bees are found near the entrances or any 
crack in the hive, any place where bees can uh, enter or exit, and on the periphery of the cluster. There's very few guard bees anywhere in the center of the cluster. There is no need to put smoke in the center of the cluster, only where the, on the periphery. It's okay to blow on the nurse bees. They're not going to respond to that at all. <coughs> Don't take my word for it. Try it yourself. <laughs> You look for the heads of these bees. This is, this is a bee acting as a guard. That's a bee acting as a guard. They are ready to launch. They got there out there. And you see them just ready to go. Those are the bees you pay attention to. Those are the bees you want to turn their heads around with a little bit of smoke. If they're looking at you, <laughs> they are aware of you. I don't want to ever see bees aware of me. So the question is, how much smoke to use? Use just enough smoke that you don't ever have any bees looking at you. If they're not looking at you, you may go for the rest of the inspection without any smoke. If they keep coming back and looking at you, a little bit of smoke just to keep them from looking at you. That's all you need to do. The smoke should always be white, cool, and dense. If the smoke gets gray or starts to falter, stop what you're doing. Take the smoker apart. Go to the bottom of the smoker. Relight the smoker. Don't keep going on. Okay, so I've opened up a box. Bees all over the top bars. We're not ready to touch this box yet because there's too many bees in the way. You give them a very slight puff of smoke, and in a few seconds, now this box is ready to touch. You've got the bees off the top bars. I already talked about that. Shaking bees. You can shake bees right off the combs all the time. It has nothing to do with defensive behavior. It does not elicit any defensive behavior. We can do alcohol wash samples like this all day long wearing no protective gear at all. It does not cause any kind of stinging at all. Makes a lot of noise, a lot of bees making noise in the air, but they're not being defensive in any way. <coughs> so we call it a hive inspection. The bees call it invading our sanctuary. Keep that in mind. See the world through the bee's point of view. <clears throat> okay, so I asked Stephanie to pose for a few slides here. Come up to the hive, look at the entrance of the hive first. Learn everything you can first. Look for dead bees on the entrance. See, are they fresh? Are they old? Uh, what's happening at the entrance? After it's rained or there's, or there's no flight weather, um, you often see some dead bees on the entrance. That is normal, but look at the number of dead bees there. On cool mornings, look for nosema crawlers on the grass. A lot of them will have pollen loads on their legs. They have bee and if you pick those up, they often are sky high levels of, of nosema. Um, they just don't have the energy to get back into the uh, entrance. This is a deformed wing uh, crawler, a bee that uh, is committing altruistic self-removal from the hive, but it can't fly, so it has to crawl out. So as you approach your hives in the summer, look on the ground and see if you see any crawlers. If you've got crawlers, you've got a varroa problem. See how many bees are bringing in pollen. If they're bringing in a lot of pollen, the colony is probably queen right and healthy. If they have mixed loads of pollen, different colors of pollen, they probably have good nutrition coming in. Single color pollen, they may not have good nutrition coming in. Okay, is there a nectar flow on? You can tell before you open the hive, you simply look at the, how distended the abdomens are of the bees coming back. If they're distended and the, the bands, the plates, abdominal plates are separated, uh, that's because the crop is full of nectar. That'll be a really easy colony to work. <coughs> if you wanna know which hives in the yard to inspect, just run down, give them all a heft. The colony that is not putting on weight is the one you wanna inspect. That's the one's the problem. Easiest metric to look at is healthy colonies put on weight, for colonies that have a problem, don't put on weight. In the fall, if they're not taking their syrup or if they're not taking a pollen patty, if we see a colony like this in the fall, we just write it off, move it to the sick yard, don't even bother with it. Don't even try to save it. If they're not taking pollen patties, it is a waste of your time trying to save that colony. Here again, look at the abdomens. You can see the crops completely full of nectar right there, bees coming back. Here's uh, no nectar flow right here. Bees coming back with very short abdomen. So this colony will be much more defensive, probably perhaps under nutritional strength, uh, stress. Look to see if there's guards. Look to see on the entrance. If you see any bees standing here, 
turning and facing the incoming foragers. That'll tell you whether or not you're going to have to use uh, more smoke or not. Wave your hand in front of them. If you see bees, heads following your hand movement, if you see bee, feel bees coming out and bumping off your hand, that tells you a lot about colony temperament. Give them a little bit of smoke. Now also when you smoke, look at the airflow at the hive, okay, in the entrance. Typically your hive will have one side for air inlet and one side for air outlet. So if you smoke right here, where's all the smoke going? Out. Didn't do a damn thing to the hive. If you smoke here, where's the smoke going? It's being sucked right in. So one little tiny puff of smoke being sucked in does a lot more good than a whole bunch of smoke being blown out. Uh -huh. Does that have to do with the airflow? Probably does, and I haven't seen a particular pattern on that, but just you can check it with the smoke very easily which way it's, it's going. As you lift the cover or lift any box, immediately blow smoke underneath. See how it's coming out right here? Use that cover or the upper box to direct the smoke to keep it there, to put a thin layer of smoke there. You can reduce your use of smoke. Smoke is dangerous for you, it's dangerous for the bees. It shuts down. Uh, a well-smoked colony doesn't produce honey for that day. They just, they just shut down. Use the minimal amount of smoke possible. And always, as you do every step, a little tiny bit of smoke under, uh, in between. Okay, turn their heads around here. See what happened right there? The effect of the wind? I blew smoke right across here, the smoke drifted this way, cleared all the bees off the top bars there. Those bees never got any smoke. I went through the motions of smoking, but it didn't smoke half the bees that I intended to. Use the wind to your advantage. Who put the cardboard there? You should recognize that. <laughs> what is that? Hopguard. That's Hopguard 2. Hopguard. Hopguard 2. Hopguard 1 was a smooth strip, Hopguard 2 is the corrugated strip. There's Stephanie waving her hand to see if there's any response. <coughs> Listening to the bees, smelling the bees, seeing the bees, get, using all your senses. <coughs> outside comb. If you've got burr comb in between the box and the outside comb, don't pull the outside comb off first because all the bees coming up and getting rolled there will be crushed and release alarm pheromone. Go to the second comb in. We keep all of our frames always uh, squeeze tight together so we always have a 3 8 inch space on all four corners. That way you can shove them all over and give yourself a 3 quarter inch clearance for the first comb you pull out every time you open a box. Do you run 10 frames or not? 10 frames, always. My large part of my business is selling nukes, which means our business model is to draw combs. We buy pre-assembled frames for $2 a piece, and the next year we sell them for $30 a piece. That's a $28 margin per comb, uh, comb, margin per comb that we sell. Okay, so we, um, and our clientele wants perfectly drawn combs. Our business is to produce perfectly drawn combs. We put 10 frames in a box, otherwise you will not get perfectly drawn combs. The other trick we do also is we always run a drone frame in every colony. If you run a drone frame, the bees put all the drone brood in the drone frame, they don't put it on your new combs, and then you can sell combs that are free of drone brood. Get a really good grasp in bars. I see people do this little tiny itty bitty fingertip grasp. <laughs> Get a good grasp, those combs are, are heavy. And uh, when I lift them up, I use this middle finger to pry against the top of the hive body and do all the pushing with my finger rather than with lifting with my back to pull that first comb out. Very, very slow on that first comb coming up. The mistake I see beginners make all the time is they start to tip it just about this, this stage right here, and I hear the roar of bees as they all get brushed off the bottom, and I, and I hear it behind my back say, don't do that. They go, do what? I said, you know, knock all those bees off. I didn't knock any bees off. I said, I can hear it from over here. <laughs> Lift, make sure the comb is completely clear of the top bars before you start to tip it. The queens often run down the comb, try to go underneath, and right then is right when you brush that there, beginners kill a tremendous amount of queens that way. When I have beginners classes, I used to put out a, a, a nuke for every beginner out in the, uh, in the yard, freshly mated, or, you know, nice newly mated queen, uh, laying well, and have each beginner inspect it, and the next day I typically see about 30% of the queens dead. 
That's typical for a beginner inspection to kill a very large proportion of your queen. As soon as I get that first frame out, I do one puff right down here in case any bees have been disturbed, right in that hole. And immediately you look for the queen on the next comb. If you're looking for queens and you're pulling out combs, half the time, 50% of the time, she will be on the face of the comb facing you that's in the hive. Okay, that's been mathematically proven that she'll half the time be on facing you and half the time she'll be on the side away from you. <laughs> oh God, we, we, we like hard data. <laughs> I only keep a single gap open. Typically I'll make a gap of two frames. If you have a gap of two frames in a, in a hive, you have enough angle to look down and you look for the queen. So um, most of the time, or about half the time, I find the queen on the still while she's still inside the hive. So when I pull the next frame out, I look on the back side of that one because I've already looked at the front side while it was still in the hive. Um, sometimes when I want to show off, I'll just take a high, uh, like a, with a single, I'll pull the two combs out and I'll go and just move the creams across and just spot the queen down there. When you're first in the hive without ever pulling a frame out, when you first look down a, the frames at an angle, the queen, stand, before she's disturbed, stands out higher than the rest of the bees. She stands like a sore thumb. So you don't, uh, looking for queens, like we're pulling queens for sale, we often don't pull the frames out of a hive. We just flip them over and just look for the queen uh, looking down. Oh man, we had a guy get yelled at by my sons recently. <laughs> they said, we had a helper and we gave him the smoker to help. And we're going through highs and Eric says, smoke! 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 The guy finally smokes and oh god, Eric got stung up really, really bad. And the helper goes, Oh, I guess that was my fault, huh? And they said, Yes! <laughs> Your fault. A second delay made all over the world. If he would have given a puff of smoke when Eric said smoke, there would have been no problem at all. That delay of not seeing what we the rest of us all saw with the bees starting to pour out the entrance was what get the whole uh, defensive response going and Eric. Well, we all got stung up really bad. Uh, so don't delay. If you pick up a box and it pulls up the frames from the bottom, oh God, really, really bothers the bees a lot. That would require a lot of smoke or just leave that hive alone for a while. <clears throat> don't put anything in front of the hive to disrupt the, the foragers coming back. That tells them that something's wrong. You, you guys, Seeing all the little tiny itty bitty tips, every one of these makes a difference in being able to, makes a difference between having to wear full gear and being able to work your bees in shorts and a t-shirt. If you want to do inspection, you need to have good illumination on the comb. You need to have the sun shining down into the cells. If you want to do that and you look for the sun and find it, at that point you've blinded yourself. You don't have to you take my word for it. You look at the sun, you will not be able to see eggs for a while afterwards because you've blinded yourself temporarily. So what you do, look for your shadow, and this, whoop, this right here is telling me that the sun is directly behind my back and the sun is going directly into those cells, okay? You can tell by looking at the ground and not blinding yourself. Okay. When I hear people say, oh God, yeah, inspect every frame in a hive, do these long inspections, I go, what in the world? I would never recommend that to anybody. Bees will only tolerate a quick inspection. A one minute inspection is a long inspection for me to inspect a hive, okay? You're, you know, I know exactly what I'm looking for. I'm in the hive, I'm out, before the bees hardly even know that I've been in and out. Get in and out of the hive, leave the bees alone. Now, if you're a beginner and you're needing to learn about inspecting bees, do it in very small colonies as they're growing and get in that hive every day or every other day. Really disruptive, you're gonna kill queens and all that, don't worry about it, that's your learning curve. Once you know you're keeping bees and you wanna be a productive beekeeper and practice good bee husbandry, then the absolute minimum amount of inspection, minimum amount of time of inspection per hive. <coughs> If you got a frame out and the bees ball up here and you try to shove it back in, oh God, I was watching a, a mentor uh, at one of the bee clubs um, want to do a demonstration and he puts on his full gear and his gloves and his veil and I go, oh crap. I, said, I went back to the car and said, I better get my veil on too. <laughs> <laughs> and I walk back and he's showing the group, you know, this, this frame and it was uh, some uh, dark, dark bees that were a little bit touchy. 
And uh, he gets ready to put the frame back in. And I said, you see the queen on that frame, right? And he goes, oh, yeah. And here's the queen right here. And he's got nine frames in the hive, a little slot right there. And the bees are all balled up around the queen. And he takes that frame and goes, Whoa! and he shoves that frame back in. That was the mentor of that entire club. If they ball up on the frame, just give them a shake. Shake them off and then put the frame back in. That way you don't crush the bees. Wait, you would even shake the frame with the queen? No, normally I don't do it with the queen. Right. No. I would normally pick the queen off. Or what I'll do is I'll pull another frame out, put the frame with the queen on, with the queen on the safe side, and then put the other frame back in. We do that, we do that a lot. They crush a bee, it releases alarm pheromone. These are called Hoffman self-spacing uh, end bars on your frames. They're there for a purpose. They space the frames to allow bee space. The bee queen will often want to run around the end bar right here. As I put a frame back in, I line up this side with that outside of the next end bar. And then as you go down, there's no chance of the queen getting put, crushed. If you put the frame in and then shove it over, you will wind up crushing queens. So as you put the frame in, put it back in the right position rather than doing the shove over. OK. General rule. <laughs> now, if you disturb a colony, and you can try this experiment. Go out to your favorite colony, your favorite queen, and just poke her a few times and make her run. And her bees will jump on her and try to sting her. They will kill her. OK? Really easy to do. Don't take my word for it. <laughs> you disturb a colony enough, you get the queen doing erratic behavior, her bees will often attack her. Okay? So when we're doing something where the, it's very disruptive to the colony, we just carry these little Jay Z's, Bee Z's queen cages in our pockets. We just take the queen, put her inside there, grab a couple of uh, clover leaves or gra grass leaves, wad them up, and shove them in the entrance, and, and stick the queen for safekeeping. That way you can do whatever you want to that hive. After you close it up, the, those leaves will wilt, the bees will pull them out, the queen will step out when the colony's calm and you don't lose queens. Very good tip for you. Save a lot of queens that way. If you're combining colonies, if you're um, doing major disruption. Can you tell us what, your, like, what are your main steps of, of lifting the queen? Where, where are you lifting her from and what are your three steps? Can... Spot the queen, wait till she's facing away from your fingers this way, approach her from behind and grab her two wings and pick her up. There's a good video Mike Palmer has called Queens Have Handles. Look on, on YouTube. Yes, they have handles. They have those two wings. You just grab those two wings, up they go. When you want to cage her, you put her head into the cage very carefully. And then put your finger behind her admin, not, not pressing her admin, but behind so she can't back up. And then as you release her, her, her uh, wings, watch her. She should walk in. If not, give her a little tap with the other finger on the tip of her admin, and, and then she'll go into there. And then when you go to snap the lid on the cage, make sure she hasn't turned around and stuck her antenna out, so you don't want to snap the lid over her antenna. Tasting honey. I, uh, years ago, I was selling a nuke to, nukes to a Russian beekeeper, just to come to the United States. And we're on a honey flow, and I took a taste of honey. And, and just as I'm going to my mouth, he goes, oh, and he grabs my wrist, he goes, don't do that. I go, what are you talking about? And he goes, in Russia, when he was a young guy, he watched a friend do that, and a bee landed on the honey on the way to the mouth, put it in his mouth, bee stung him in the throat, and the guy died in front of him. Throat swelled up and died right there. Um, and yeah, I, I was tasting honey last year. I said, man, that honey is really spicy. And sons go, that doesn't taste spicy to me. I go, that's like the spiciest honey. It's, it's like, it like burns my mouth. And I'm talking about it for about five minutes. I go, that honey is still burning. I'm amazed. I, oh, there's a stinger in my, <laughs> in my gum. <laughs> so yes, you can get stung in the mouth very easily. Just, so watch your finger as it goes to your mouth because bees will often land on it on the way to the mouth. There's Tiffany just showing, dressed appropriately in black clothing with a red headband. <laughs> OK, but not a problem because she's working deliberately. If you're a beginning beekeeper, don't go into big hives to start with, OK? These are how our bees look coming back from almonds when we're getting ready to split them. They are just overflowing with bees. These are uh, much more difficult colonies to work with than small ones. Beginners work with little tiny hives. Learn how to do it. There's Eric and Ian. Uh, winter 
um, nuke making, dressed to the to the hilt. Okay, here's the thing I notice. The problem most people have looking for problems in a hive is there's, it's like looking for a queen. If you're saying there, there's about 2,000 bees on a frame, about 1,000 bees on, a, on, a, on one side of a frame. If you have to go worker, not a queen, worker, not a queen, worker, not a queen, worker, not a queen, a thousand times on a side, it's going to take you a long time to spot the queen. What you need to do is look at the frame and go, ignore all workers, look for the queen. And then you just spot the queen very quickly. And people go, how do you find the queen so fast? It's because I'm not having to do that process of elimination of looking at every single worker and determining whether or not it's a queen or not. Okay? You learn to ignore normal. Ignore all the pictures in the bee books of normal and look for the anomaly. Look for a disproportion of bees to brood. Look for a disproportion of young brood to old brood. Look for the, the uh, erratic cell that looks different and look for the the, uh, the bee that looks different, the queen that looks different, or the bee with deformed wings. That's maybe the best thing I can, if you're going to go out and do colony inspections, is focus on the anomaly and ignore normal. Okay? It's kind of like, where's Waldo? Yeah. Okay, tell me the anomaly. Yellow jacket. Yellow jacket. There's a yellow bee there. Yeah, or, or a bee covered with what? Pollen. No. Queen's not an anomaly. I'll give you a hint. Two queens is the anomaly. Okay? Look for, notice the anomaly on a frame, the thing that stands out. What's the anomaly? Instantly, what's the first thing you see wrong? Scattered brood. What's the second thing you see? The deformed wing bee. What's the other thing you see? Yeah, there's one, there's one right there. Oh, you're missing the main one. Yeah, look at all these larvae dying. All those are dying larvae, dying larvae, dying larvae, dying larvae. All those are dying. Those are major anomalies right there. That should stand out instantly to you. That's a good bee to brood ratio. Look at this one. This was taken, uh, this was taken in, uh, in uh, May, uh, still with uh, cool nights, but there's just not enough bees. You would never have had that many bees raising that amount of brood. So that means that your recruit, your attrition ratio is uh, exceeding your recruitment ratio of bees. This colony is on a downhill slope. It's about to collapse. This colony is suffering from CCD. It will, will very soon die. Even though you look at this beautiful brood pattern right here, this colony is on, on the downhill because the ratio is wrong. Could you save that colony? What's that? Could you save it? Uh, not likely save this one. This was actually in an experiment. We had inoculated with a, a, strain, a very virulent strain of an Israeli acute paralysis virus. Here's another colony, mid collapse. This colony will be toast within a day or so. All the bees will just disappear. Again, so, and why? What, what, what's happening right here? What's the problem this, that for, what's the problem for the brood right now? What's the problem for the brood? Not enough bees to keep it warm at night. That brood will get chilled and they'll die overnight. Okay? When it's real hot, don't, don't the bees come off the brood? Yeah. But in, in, this, in this case, the reason for this pattern is the brood's dying from just not enough bees in the hive. This is a colony in the middle of colony collapse. Uh, chronic paralysis virus, the latest report out from the USDA survey, or Bee Informed Partnership survey, is that chronic paralysis virus is increasing across the United States right now. We, we see it fairly often. There's two forms for chronic paralysis virus. This one's called hairless black syndrome, where the bees nip all the hairs off um, a bee. All, all honeybees are black. It's their hairs that make them look yellow. You take the hairs off, they all turn, they're all black underneath, okay? And see the tattered wings, the bees will nip at this. So this bee puts out, uh, the virus causes it to change the hydrocarbon profile, and the bees nip all the hairs off. No, well, they're not really hairs in bees. 
if somebody nips your hair off, you do not get exposed to a virus. Um, what's the difference here? Megan, Megan, you're the epidemiologist. What is it about nipping the hairs off of bees that will infect other bees? I'm, ch I'm challenging our epidemiologist here because we've been having fun this morning. <laughs> okay, anybody, what about dip, nipping off hairs is an advantage to the virus? Why would the virus want that behavior? Do you have virus particle variants on your hair? Not on, on your hair, but it also opens up, um, it also opens up the exoskeleton. Right. The bees don't have hairs. They have projections of the exoskeleton. When you break off a hair, you expose hemolymph, which has variants. Okay, so it's very different than your hair. The bee's mouth is in contact with the surface they're going to get the... Not with the surface. There aren't any brains on the surface. It's in contact with the hemolymph. When you break a bee's hair off, it's hollow and it exposes hemolymph and virions. It's a huge difference, uh, okay? So it's to the virus's advantage to initiate bee behavior for other bees to break off the hairs and expose them to the virions. And this is what they do in chronic paralysis virus. Yes, and it's hollow, and it has hemolymph in it. Yeah. Some of the, uh, we've had a couple of beekeepers in our area demonstrate what, what they refer to as blind drone. drone. The, uh, the drones have like a, a gray film over their, their eyes. Huh. Uh, if you pick at it, you can pull it off. I'll be darned. Yeah, I, I, you see a lot of anomalies with drones, and I don't know whether that's a genetic one or whether it's a sign of disease. Since drones are haploid, any, uh, any um, deleterious gene is expressed. So you see a lot of weird-looking uh, drones. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, one, one guy in the area was saying that this is you know, what you're talking about here, where it's about this new virulent strain of... I have no idea. Whatever, but It'd be interesting to have... Yeah, interesting. I have no, no idea what that would be. This is the second form of chronic paralysis virus. We've been seeing a fair amount of this where it looks like a pesticide kill. You got a whole bunch of bees in the bottom board. They're all twitching. It's not pesticide, it's because we don't have pesticides in, in my area. It's a chronic paralysis uh, virus. And we'll see, sometimes you see it in two or three yards in, in a, a hives in a, in, a, in a yard. It's just incredibly ugly. It just, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of bees just uh, alive but twitching and dying. Yeah. The previous slide with the black bee, that one would, would be paralyzed? Would it be no. sitting there? So no, they tend, they tend to shake. Okay, they tend the to shake. black bee would be the one shaking. You wouldn't yes. see it on any of the other bees. In that no, you see, you see this scattered, and it's not uncommon for us to see one or two bees in, in the occasional hive with, with this form. This form is worse. <clears throat> Usually what I'll see in the springtime is maybe, maybe a handful, maybe a dozen bees or so at the, uh, just kicked out of the hive but still alive and kind of twitching there on the ground. And then the, the bad ones look just like, like this right here. And the treatment for these? No, tr no treatment. Breeding. Okay. Uh, Tom uh, Seeley, uh, not Tom Seeley, Tom Rinderer from USDA did his uh, doctoral dissertation on uh, breeding for resistance to this. You simply take all those dead bees, you grind them up, make a slurry, put in sugar syrup, feed it to your hives, you breed from the survivors. <laughs> Three generations, you have re uh, chronic paralysis virus resistant bees. Very easy to breed for resistance to it. Is that similar to us around? From the survivor. The survivor, well, you do it to enough, you have, you have survivors, yeah. Small, if you, if you don't see, if you, you can look right here to see the small hot beetle larvae, that's another other one to look for. Okay, I talked last night about looking for the jelly. This is a, a well-fed colony, plenty of jelly around uh, uh, the brood. This is an extremely well-fed colony. You want to see lots of jelly around those very young larvae. If you, don't, if you see the nurses cutting back in the jelly, the colony's under nutritional stress. Okay, look at the larvae, sac brood. Nothing to do about sac brood. We don't see that much of it. Spotty brood, figure out why. It's common in my area, at least in the late summer, for all the colonies to have spotty looking brood just because of nutritional uh, deficiency. <clears throat> in the springtime, new queen, young queen laying well, brood looks perfect. 
Later in the season, all the brood patterns tend to fall apart to some extent. <coughs> Frank Eichen, Dr. Frank Eichen pointed out that uh, anytime you have um, less than 50% sealed brood, that it's indicating that you have a, a high larval mortality. So look at your ratio of, of open brood to uh, sealed brood. If you have larvae of uneven age side by side, that means you have high larval mortality. The queen's laying eggs and the larvae are either being eaten by the nurse bees or dying. Uh, during nutritional dearth, it's uh, very common for the queen to lay a ton of eggs every day and the nurse bees to follow behind and eat all the eggs right <coughs> behind, behind her. Here's the EFB. Nancy, you look like that? Yeah, that's typical, typical EFE symptoms right there. These uh, larvae twisted in the, in the cells. There's more EFB. You can see the uh, tracheal net becomes very apparent and more twisting in the cells. Some of them melt down looking like this, but they won't rope like American fowl brood. That one looks pretty dark. That might, might fool you. You might think that it's American fowl brood, but you won't get the, the rope. Chalk brood always has this very distinctive dark and light pattern in the cells. Nothing you can do about chalk brood other than replace your queen. I was, um, I was over in uh, God, one of the southern eastern states a couple of years ago, and they were just in a chalk brood epidemic. Every hive, at least half the cells of brood in every hive, were dying from chalk brood. I said, where are you getting your queens from? Oh, get them from the same guy every year. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> isn't there a quote by Einstein about, uh, about uh, something about that? Yeah, change your queen stock. Can you change the column? If you change your queen stock, you won't have to. Okay. Uh, viruses and brood, so these are all dead larvae and pupae dying from uh, uh, virus infection, most likely deforming virus. <coughs> Oops, double up on that one. The color. Sorry. No, no, the color of them. And the the, the color yeah. the color's not white. Okay. Any larvae or pupae that you see that are healthy are pure white. If they're any other color, they're white, they're sick. Very good question. Look for the color. Okay. All of you should immediately say this is a clear colony clearly infected with AFV, everybody say it together. AFV, this is as clear as can be. Sunken, perforated cappings and caramel colored larvae. AFB, this should, everybody in this room should have in unison shouted out AFB. AFB. Incredibly infective disease that is running rampant in many areas of the country because people don't recognize it at first glance. Where's little sun sticking up? I don't see that. Well, if you look enough, you will find it. You don't have to see that. This should be plenty for you. There are three signs right here of AFB, or four signs. Okay, I didn't ask for excuses. I'm saying this <laughs> is what you should recognize. Okay, <laughs> jeez. Okay, how often have you seen a gorilla? But you would recognize, or a rhinoceros? You would recognize it, right? We're working on recognition, not on your experience. Okay, scattered brood, perforated, Irregular perforations, sunken cappings, and that caramel color of the larvae. Very clear signs of AFB. Recognize those immediately. And then the rope right here, the roping as the bacteria release a proteolytic enzyme which digests the protein in the larvae and makes, turns them into glue. Okay, that's the... Randy, does AFB always rope? Yeah. Almost. Always, as a, to, if you ask a scientist <laughs> and you put the word always in any question to a scientist, we are compelled to say there's no such thing as always. <laughs> in general, yes, it will rope. And in general, it will smell, but it doesn't always smell. I've seen really roping AFB that didn't have an odor. It's unusual, but it can happen. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. I found a cap cell with the dark, looked like American fowl brood sequence. Uh huh. But it didn't rope. Yeah, so not. So it's still, that 
is considered that would not be American, most likely not American file breed. But it, is it so do the you could do the either do the um, uh, ELISA test or do the Holtz milk test that would tell you. All right, so that would I did a, a European file breed. I had a kit. For yeah. Okay. European file breed and it came out negative. Came out negative. Yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Okay, but it didn't rope in the very water. Right. There's, we also have uh, what's called an idiopathic brood disease syndrome, which we don't know what it is, which will cause really watery, dying larvae that don't rope. But they're not, Ameri well, not American foul brood. Okay. We, we, we're, we're, we're seeing lots of unusual things. Okay. The, the American foul brood, here's the signs. Sunken perforated cappings and spotty brood pattern and this caramel color. I keep mentioning the caramel color. It's very, very distinctive. The caramel color, sunken perforated cappings, the caramel color, and there you go. You happy now? <laughs> There's your pupil tongue you were looking for. So if you find dead pupils, that they, they can't be American because they wouldn't have gotten to that stage? No, European doesn't normally hit the pupae. American uh, generally hits the pupae. So it's the, uh, this is very common for American to hit the pupae. Okay. If you have perforated cappings, it has to be pupae, right? Because that's old. That's pupal age. They don't. Okay. 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 So if you find dead pupae, then and they're, they're actually formed in there, then that, that couldn't have been American. They, they wouldn't. Have, they wouldn't. Have, they would have melted down. They. I'm not really clear on your question. If you have pupae that turn this color, yeah. high and they have a suspect American fabric. If their tongue's up. Really strongly suspect American foul brood. If they rope, you've got American foul brood. Okay, they generally will smell too. But the the point, what what's the one thing I keep repeating here? Color. The color <laughs> that really tells you American foul brood. The other is the scale. Oops, the scale, and advanced, especially if you're buying any kind of used equipment. First, I would never buy used combs. <laughs> I wouldn't even take used combs if you give them to me. Uh, the scale on them, that's that's very distinctive. So on your dead outs, if you have dead outs before you put bees back on them next year, make sure there's no scale on the bottom, this black scale. That's that, that gluey caramel colored, after, you after the water evaporates, it glues to the bottom of the cell and it's just full of spores, yeah. What do you do about it when you find it before and after? Before you get it, is there something you can do to prevent it? And if you find it- Wait, if you find it before you get it, then just burn, burn those combs. Okay, you burn the combs. Yeah, there's no, um, Technically, you're allowed to treat them with Tylosin, and that will often clear it up, but then you still have spores in your equipment. Personally, I prefer not to do that. Many commercial beekeepers do that. They just, and, and if they ever stop using Tylosin, their whole operation is gonna crash American foul brood. Um, but personally, um, since I sell so many nukes, I don't wanna sell people if spores, so we wanna flush it out, so we don't, don't, don't do any kind of uh, treatment of American foul brood. We, our treatment is burning the combs. We hang on here. One sec second question. Um, I just wanted to say I'm going to give a talk on American Fabric today and, and say what we're supposed to do in New York State. So I'll Great. Okay. Good. Okay, here's how you look for the, uh, the scale. Sun over your back, top bar towards you, so the light eliminates the, the uh, cell floors, and you can see the scale very easily. Okay, this is the first sign of deformed wing virus epidemic. These uh, discolored, the, the color on the, on the uh, pro pupae here. Um, uh, this, uh, this pupa is uh, melanized in between the eyes right there. We're seeing actual deforming virus bees, but these, look at, first you, you see it in the uh, pupae and the pro pupae. We call this parasitic mite syndrome, but just, uh, they just look really sick. This is, uh, at this stage, it's kind of hard to turn the colony around. These are uh, fecal deposits of Varroa. This colony is collapsing from a high Varroa level. Tip it up and you can see the white fecal deposits. That tells you you have extremely high Varroa level in that hive. How do you tell that this is Varroa sensitive hygiene and not a viral infection? I already told you some a minute ago. Who remembers? The color. What color are they? White. <laughs> Those are caramel. <laughs> they're white. These are these are white. If they're white, that means they were still alive and healthy, being chewed out. That's called varroa-sensitive hygiene. 
If they were discolored, that means they were already dying and then they were being chewed out. So they chew them out because they, what, sense the varroa are in there? No, they chew them out because the uh, pupae, when they get, uh, start to lose the battle with a virus and their immune system starts to uh, be, uh, be unable to contain the virus, they change their, uh, the odor of their particular hydrocarbons. The bees that are bred for varroa sensitive hygiene recognize that odor and then, then so the pupae say, sacrifice me, and then the bees will remove them. That's what we want to breed for. Very, it's different than freeze killed hygiene. It's particular for viral sensitive hygiene. This is bald brood where the bees will uncap the uh, pupae often when they're purple eyed, but I see it a lot with the white eyed also. And they meet, just go ahead and close them back up again. Here's one uh, varroa sensitive hygiene here. I often see them together and um, they may recap them and those, they may still survive. Nobody knows what this is. I suspect it has to do with a, uh, the bees discovering inadvertently that um, reducing the humidity in these cells probably suppresses the um, success of survival of the young mites. Yeah? It can also be a sign of wax moths that are coming on underneath. Yeah, if you see them in a straight line, it can be a young wax moth, yes. But when you just see it scattered, it's generally not wax moth. Don't know. Yeah, you're right. Don't know. I haven't, haven't noticed, noticed that particularly. And here, if you see seeing bees with, with bro on their backs like this and deformed wings, it, that colony's pretty well along with uh, bad infestation. I think that's the, yeah, that's the last slide. <laughs>